Let's take a look at the glomerular filtration rate. And what the glomerular filtration rate is, is just the rate of filtration. And so keep in mind, we know that substances, water and small particles, will be driven out of the glomerulus and into Bowman's capsule, the capsular space of Bowman's capsule. That's known as filtration. And the filtration rate, the glomerular filtration rate, the GFR, all that is is the rate at which filtration is taking place. And the average glomerular filtration rate is 125 mils per minute, and that's the um, amount of filtrate that's produced by both kidneys in one minute. And so the filtration rate is an important thing to consider because we are living beings, right? So we're producing waste at a certain rate, and because of that, the kidneys need to filter those wastes out of the blood at that same rate. If the kidneys slowed down for any reason, then what would happen is waste products would continue to accumulate in our blood and we'd become toxic. And that's why the glomerular filtration rate is so important. We have to regulate the rate at which we remove waste from the blood so that it's at least, you know, at equilibrium with the rate that we're producing waste so that we don't start accumulating wastes. Hopefully that makes sense. So there are two main ways that we regulate the um, glomerular filtration rate. Uh, one is like a localized control called autoregulation, and the other way is through hormones. So let's take a look at uh, autoregulation first. Uh, autoregulation has to do with a specific area in the nephron, and so called the juxtaglomerular apparatus. And so let's just take a look at that, and then we'll uh, come back to that slide. So the juxtaglomerular apparatus, you can kind of tell in the name, I think, you know, what this is all about, right? So you can hear uh, juxta right next to glomerulus, right next to the glomerulus apparatus. That's an older term, complex, that's a newer term, same thing. So the juxtaglomerular complex or the juxtaglomerular apparatus has to um, do with sensitive cells that are close to the glomerulus. And so taking a look at this bigger picture of uh, the nephron, do you notice how uh, here's Bowman's capsule, and then here's the proximal convoluted tubule, uh, loop of Henle. And then I'm noticing that the distal convoluted tubule is taking a sweep right by Bowman's capsule. So that's the distal convoluted tubule. And that's what they're zeroing in on here. Okay, and so this tubule is the distal convoluted tubule. And I can see that the distal convoluted tubule, okay, so this is distal, is adhered to the afferent arteriole. So here's the afferent arteriole coming in. We know that this is the glomerulus. Here's our afferent arteriole uh, taking blood away from the glomerulus. And the afferent arteriole uh, contains one part of the juxtaglomerular apparatus. There are these specialized smooth muscle cells within the afferent arteriole. This is how the kidney is so sensitive at monitoring uh, blood pressure. Uh, these specialized smooth muscle cells, they're called granular cells, or they're also known as um, juxtaglomerular cells. But those are just specialized smooth muscle cells, and that's where the kidney is detecting blood pressure. The other part of the juxtaglomerular apparatus is this specialized group of cells in the distal convoluted tubule. And you can see they're adhering right in that same vicinity as the granular cells. Those are called the macula densa. And the macula densa and the distal convoluted tubule, what they do is they're sensitive to uh, sodium levels within the filtrate of that tubule. And so together, uh, with the afferent arteriole kind of monitoring the blood pressure and the distal convoluted tubule, monitoring what the salt concentration is, together this area makes up what people call the juxtaglomerular apparatus. And this is where uh, a hormone like renin is um, secreted. Uh, this is where erythropoietin comes from. And so this is the sensitive area in the kidney that we've been alluding to for a while. Um, this is exactly you know where it is and, and what it's made out of. So as far as regulating the glomerular filtration rate, let's look back at a slide. We were saying that one way that it could be regulated is just due to auto-regulation. In other words, it's going to regulate itself. It's a localized control. And all that happens there is the juxtaglomerular apparatus monitors the blood pressure. That's what's known as a myogenic mechanism when those smooth muscle cells, and we've looked at this before, kind of sense what the blood pressure is. 
And then based on the blood pressure, if it feels a lot of stretch and there's a high pressure or there's no stretch and there's a low pressure, appropriate adjustments are made to the diameter of the efferent arteriole just to keep that glomerular filtration rate within the normal range. And so it's like autopilot, if you will. And then the other uh, mechanism is what's called tubuloglomerular feedback. And what that has to do with is the macula densa, sensing what the uh, salt concentration is in the distal convoluted tubule. So just to go back to that picture for a minute, um, if there's a lot of salt in the filtrate, what that means is the filtration rate is high, that you know it's moving through the nephron quickly, and so we're, we're not having enough time to reabsorb that salt. Compared to if the salt concentration in here was low, that means that the filtration rate is low, and um, that's because you have more time to reabsorb salt, and so we monitor this too. The um, second major way that we regulate the glomerular filtration rate is just with um, hormone hormones, hormonal regulation. And so this is pretty much a review because the hormones that we've talked about that uh, regulate blood pressure will also affect the glomerular filtration rate. And so something like angiotensin II, aldosterone, ADH, and I know those sound familiar, but just as a quick review, um, as far as the uh, renin-angiotensin mechanism, we understand that the liver uh, always produces a plasma protein called angiotensinogen, so that's a normal component of the blood that's always there, and that if there is a drop in blood pressure, if the kidneys sense a drop in blood pressure, if those um, granular cells sense that in the juxtaglomerular apparatus, that's when they secrete renin. And what renin will do is it's going to convert angiotensinogen into angiotensin 1. Angiotensin 1 is automatically going to get converted to angiotensin 2 once that blood passes through the lungs. There's an angiotensin converting enzyme located there, and that elicits angiotensin 2. So angiotensin 2, on its own, uh, has certain effects. Uh, and angiotensin 2 causes vasoconstriction. Uh, it will also increase the amount of sodium being reabsorbed in the proximal convoluted tubule, so it can act kind of like aldosterone, just at a different in a different region of the nephron. But we know that angiotensin II is also a stimulus for aldosterone release, and so to uh, look at that, um, we remember hopefully that if the kidney sensed that decrease in blood pressure, kidneys release renin, uh, renin converts angio. Um, tensinogen to angiotensin 1, which automatically gets converted to angiotensin 2. And in this picture, what they're focusing on is angiotensin 2 is a powerful stimulus for aldosterone release. And so aldosterone is released. Aldosterone targets the kidneys. It causes sodium retention at the level of the kidney. And so that's going to make our body fluids more salty, right? It, they're going to have a higher concentration. And just to recall what that will do, uh, if we have a higher salt concentration in the blood, the hypothalamus will sense that. And you know what the hypothalamus can do about that is cause the posterior pituitary to release ADH. ADH also targets the kidneys, and that's going to cause water retention at the level of the kidneys. That's going to increase our blood volume and uh, therefore increase the blood pressure. And so that is how, uh, just as a quick review, Angiotensin II, aldosterone, and ADH affect our overall blood pressure, and of course they're going to affect the glomerular filtration rate also. And so um, one other side note here, those are the two main ways that glomerular filtration rate is regulated, uh, autoregulation and, horm and hormonal regulation. But we can see um, intervention, let's call it, by the nervous system. Uh, the uh, Kidney, the nephrons, uh, do have sympathetic innervation, and if there's a fight-or-flight response, like if there was a sudden drop in blood pressure or um, something like that, you can get increased sympathetic innervation, and what that will do is it will cause vasoconstriction of the efferent arteriole, so that's going to put the kidneys on standby, so to speak, right, during our crisis, whatever it is, and that can decrease the glomerular filtration rate. And in an extreme case, this can actually cause kidney failure. So if somebody had, for instance, a sudden drop in blood pressure during a surgery, that could cause the sensitive kidneys, right, the sympathetic nervous system to innervate the kidneys to kind of um, uh, cause vasoconstriction 
which would not allow a lot of blood into the glomerulus. So naturally that would decrease the glomerular filtration rate, but it could actually uh, turn off filtration, which would be kidney failure. And if that happens, that usually comes back pretty um, quickly, like within a week. Okay. Thank you.